thankful to the uh, committee, science Club committee. For inviting me to come here today and and, uh, and deliver a public rant about one of my favorite and most long-standing pet peeves about misuse of language. Like a lot of scientists and academics, for that matter, um, precise, correct use of language means a lot. Uh, for instance. When people say, do I have to hold this? Okay. Okay. When people say epicenter, when they really just mean center, I find that kind of annoying. And when people say steroids, when they really just mean testosterone, and you say, oh, he must be using steroids, or that's like something on steroids, you really just, you know, they don't mean cortisone. Right? They mean testosterone or related steroids. So, but along those same, along that same uh, line, I think that this particular misuse or over general use of a word, drugs, is especially damaging and in the class by itself because it's it has led um, it has led to a kind of thinking which has brought us to the point where the United States is the incarceration capital of the world. So, um, the, uh, I'll talk, so I'll talk some about the use of the word, um, and I'll talk about some pharmacology to, get, to make the point that every drug is different, every drug affects us differently, um, and then talk about how we might achieve, or what some scientists are thinking about in terms of a more rational, objective classification system for drugs that we might try to move to someday. This, um, but this idea that this word drugs has sort of taken on a life of its own and has now come to have uh, implications that really go far beyond a should. I think first, uh, well, something that, that we're all aware of and maybe haven't paid much attention to. I first started to become aware of it, I think, from years of reading newspaper accounts about stories involving drugs, and it has gradually built an impression that I had that years ago, when I first, in the 60s, when I first started reading news accounts about drugs, that what drug it was, it's the specific drug that was the subject story, was mentioned like in, in the headline of the story, or at least in the first couple sentences. And then I seemed to notice by the 80s and the 90s that you could read down like three, four paragraphs in a story that started out talking about drugs. It said drugs, 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 what drug? Oh, this drug. And that sort of made me think that people were, in the press maybe, were not caring so much about what drug it was. It just this drug thing had taken on life of its own. So just some examples. I, I looked for, uh, went back in the New York Times archives there. That's nice because unlike some papers, they retain the original um, typeface. And look at story. So here's an example from 1951, as you can see. Um, kind of an interesting little story. Drug uh, cash found in a car. It says marijuana right up there at the top. So no, you don't have to think very hard about what that's about. I like uh, if you read over on the right-hand column there, um, the reefers and quotation marks. I think it's kind of cute. Here's one from 1963. Um, Ousted Harvard psychologist. I think you probably know who we're talking about there. It says there, Timothy F. Leary. And it's um, only in the second, third sentence where it mentions the specific drug, psilocybin or LSD, lysergic acid. It was just early enough that lysergic is spelled wrong and nobody caught it. Nobody knew what it was in those days. Um, interesting, it goes on to talk about how the effect, uh, the experience, the psychedelic experiences. In, to some participants, religious in nature, which you know is really not that new of a thing. Maybe in our culture we don't think of it, but many cultures um, use drugs and don't separate at all from religious experience. Now, and this is from 1986, and uh, you may remember the Iran Contra scandal. Okay, so the first person who spots the name of the specific drug in here, raise your hand. <laughs> 
Keep reading. <laughs> it is right, way down at the, the third, fourth paragraph. So anyway, that's kind of the point, that's kind of what I've been thinking about, besides the, the obvious overuse of the word drugs. Without, you know, people can say, oh, he's on drugs, and nobody questions it. What, wait, what drug? It, it, actually, it actually makes a difference. So, um, and then next, I think you will agree with me, is one of the most egregious and blatant examples of this, which is not from a newspaper story. Oh, you know what? We're not looking good for sound. You can do the sound effects. Um, I'll see if I can crank up the sound here. Oh, I'll just have to hold the uh, microphone by my computer. Oh, sorry. So I don't know what you think, but when I see something like that, I think that it, the implication, the intent is to get the viewers, kids presumably, thinking that all drugs are the same, and if you smoke marijuana, it's just like sticking a needle in your arm. So don't even think about it. But of course, kids don't think that way. Kids think, oh, this is all crap, and so I don't have to believe anything anybody tells me about drugs. So. Anyway, um, so I think that the correct use, precise use of about descriptions of drugs and avoiding this generic use of drugs is important to get people thinking correctly. So I'm going to now talk about, um, oh yeah, I forgot. So here's another one I thought was good to follow that previous slide. Um, so my thinking about uh, drugs, again, goes back to uh, the era before the war on drugs, hysteria. And also, of course, is greatly influenced by my, my biomedical training. So I know that um, how the way drugs affect us has to do with the way they affect our brains. And so that's what I want to talk about for a while now. And uh, I'm going to talk about quite a few different substances. So um, if you listen, you can learn a lot. So this uh, schematic shows um, uh, a neuron over there on the right side in the, one of the cerebral hemispheres with the red line indicating a, an axon that uh, runs uh, through the corpus callosum in the middle there and then makes, um, presumably makes a synapse with a neuron in the other cerebral hemisphere. And the point is that these synapses, these connections, these um, junctions where one neuron communicates with another are where, as far as we know, for Every, almost every psychoactive substance is um, the effect of the way the synapse functions is why the drug affects us the way it does. So here we have a, um, an actual, on the left, an actual electron micrograph of a synapse. I don't really know where it's from. I took this off the NIH website. And then on the right, a schematic that corresponds pretty much to the, um, the drawing on the left. So the, on the left, we see the top part of the the, draw, the, the micrograph here. That's the presynaptic axon terminal. And this would be the postsynaptic dendritic spine. So that's where most uh, axons make synapses onto spines of dendrites and other neurons. And the space in between, this uh, synaptic cleft, is actually uh, quite small and just as enlarged here for better illustration. The M points to mitochondria, which is something that all cells have, but all the other components that are shown here are specialized for neurons. And that's why drugs can have a specific effect. If they target specific types of, of proteins, uh, receptors that are only present in neurons, and particular types of neurons, that confers specificity onto their effect. So this names a number of the components in the uh, synapse, in the, both in the pre 
again, we're, we've been talking a lot about presynaptic side, that's the axon terminal, where it has the uh, synaptic vesicles or neurotransmitter vesicles, and with that release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, again, the space here, so these are all the actual <laughs> size of the synaptic, of the neurotransmitter vesicles. Then the neurotransmitter molecules diffuse across this very small space and bind to receptors, the neurotransmitter receptors, on the postsynaptic cell. The next slide shows us in a little bit more. Oh, and this to remind me to, again, uh, we've already been talking about the names of some of uh, the most common, most important, well, most widely used, I would say, throughout the neurons in the brain, uh, neurotransmitters. Um, those are, uh, again, names that are familiar from the quiz. Acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and now you see that um, GABA is actually an abbreviation for gamma amino butyric acid. So these are, again, the names of specific molecules. We'll look at the structure of some of them. Most of them are, are actually fairly small molecules. So how does a synapse work? Well, remember, we, the, uh, what we're just looking here is the end of a long axon, which could be, could be many centimeters long, going from one part of the brain to another. So this is uh, that axon that would extend back this way. And the ac you've heard of the action potential, the depolarization that travels along the axon would be coming this way. And it gets to the nerve terminal. And um, calcium channels there open in response to this depolarization of the membrane and let in calcium ions. Calcium ions then activate the release of the neurotransmitter vesicles and causes them to fuse with the membrane surface here and release the contents, the neurotransmitter molecules. And then those neurotransmitter molecules, as I said, diffuse across that narrow space and then bind very specifically to proteins in the membrane of the postsynaptic side of the synapse. And those uh, receptors are either, as it shows here, ion channels, which would then open in response to the binding to let in, um, as shown here, a sodium ion, which would, have, which would lead to depolarization of the postsynaptic cell. If it were a, a chloride channel, letting chloride ion in would tend to inhibit the postsynaptic cell. Or other kinds of important receptors are, are not ion channels, but activate chemical pathways in other ways in the postsynaptic cell. Um, okay, so that was step three and four. And another thing that can happen, so that's, that's the, the essence of um, synaptic transmission. But there are other important things that have to go on at the synapse as well. Uh, there are, can be receptors also in the presynaptic side, either here, right here in the synaptic cleft, or maybe uh, elsewhere in the presynaptic uh, membrane, that modulate the effect of the, of the, the function of the synapse, or the effect of the neurotransmitter, as it starts here, either inhibit uh, or enhance subsequent release. And another thing is that, so we've, we've dumped out all of this neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft that's binding to the postsynaptic receptors, and we can't just leave it there. We have to get that synapse ready for the next action potential coming down. So we have to get rid of all that neurotransmitter, and that's done either by um, being taken up or being inactivated by proteins in the presynaptic side or other um, degradation pathways or by taking, being taken up into the non-neuron cells, the glial cells in the brain. And so that's the basics of um, synaptic transmission, and again, the point is that there are lots of different parts to normal synaptic function, and different drugs can affect different targets. One thing that, although, as a, my point is that all drugs act differently on synapses, one thing that all, essentially all drugs we know of that have the effect of being addictive Again, that's sort of a layman's term. Nowadays, specialists tend to prefer words like tolerance and dependence, but we won't get into parsing that too finely. All of these drugs have a common characteristic. They activate this reward pathway that was mentioned in the, um, in the quiz, which it is true is considered to be part of the limbic system. And let's learn a little specific neuroanatomy here. This, so this is our cerebral hemisphere. This is brain cut right down the middle, cut through that corpus callosum. And in the brain stem, in the midbrain specifically of the brainstem, there is a, a region that is rich in neurons that use dopamine as their neurotransmitter. 
And the one that's more involved in the risk reward pathway is this ventral tegmental area. Um, the region called the substantia nigra is the one that uh, projects to the dorsal striatum of the basal ganglion is more involved with Parkinson's disease, or when it's when those neurons, when we lose too many of those neurons, we develop Parkinson's disease. But this projection from the ventral tegmental area to the frontal lobe and other parts of the uh, striatum is important for this what we call reinforcement or reward activity. Sides, and so the previous slide has showed the source, and now we're going to look at the target of those ventral tegmental area dopamine neurons. Um, and in terms of the reward pathway, one of the most important targets is called the nucleus accumbens. It's also part of the striatum of the basal ganglia. So you can see, so here we're now looking at a transparent uh, cerebral hemisphere, and deep within it, in each side, we have this uh, subset of the basal ganglia. And this, turning it from, again, from the front, this region right where the putamen and the caudate come together is the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so just the terminology, remember, dopamine neurons projecting from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens is important for reward. And um, in a few slides, we're gonna be looking at an actual section through brain and it's going to be right at this plane where we're cutting through the nucleus accumbens. So keep that in mind. All right. So let's start talking about some specific drugs. And I've put these in kind of an arbitrary order, but mostly going from the more addictive drugs to the ones that are uh, have less addictive properties. So starting that way, we pretty much have to put nicotine at the beginning. Um, it is recognized as at least as addictive as opiates, as addictive as heroin. It acts on acetylcholine receptors in a way that excites the dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area. So drugs don't have, some drugs directly affect those dopamine neurons and other drugs affect neurons that have direct connections to them. Um, as the uh, caption there says, the nicotine acts in a couple ways. It binds to receptors back at the cell body in the ventral tegmental area to uh, activate firing. And then there are also receptors uh, on the presynaptic nerve terminal for nicotine that accentuate uh, the amount of dopamine released. Okay, and then also up there in the high addictiveness end of the scale are the, the opiates, heroin, well, there, there's uh, some synthetic opiates like fentanyl that are also very effective and are um, used clinically. So these drugs all activate a different neurotransmitter system that I, I didn't really mention yet, the encephalin uh, endorphin receptors on neurons. Again, these are ones that also play a big role in reward and reinforcement and feed directly into the, the dopamine pathway from the ventral tegmental area. Um, besides being highly addictive, uh, opiates are uh, fairly dangerous to use, both clinically and recreationally, because the um, dosage that is an overdose that will suppress breathing is only several times greater than the effective dose for either recreational or pain suppression used clinically. Uh, besides that, it's uh, dangerous, as it says, in combination with other drugs that also suppress breathing. Uh, although, contrary to what a lot of people think, opiates, heroin by itself is not that damaging to the user. If you can avoid overdosing or avoid getting a, a contaminated batch, people can maintain a heroin ha habit for many years and be relatively healthy. Also, okay, so also up there in the high end of the uh, addictiveness scale are the stimulants, and you recognize those names, I'm sure, cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine. These are a, a class of drugs that directly affect the dopamine neur um, synapses from the VTA neurons. So they uh, affect dopamine and norepinephrine synapses, um, 
serotonin, another important neurotransmitter that um, you may be aware is more involved, we think of it more in, in mood and affect than in uh, reward, but again, all these pathways are, are linked to each other. Um, these are all affected directly by the uh, drugs in this, in this category. So um, this schematic at the bottom here uh, from an NIH website uh, shows pretty much what we were looking at before. Here's the presynaptic end that releases the neurotransmitter. Here's the postsynaptic with the receptors, um, dopamine receptors in this case. And as it says, the effect of methamphetamine, so remember I said that the neurotransmitter is released and we have to get it out of there. We can't just leave it sitting there. And uh, one of the things that does that are these dopamine transporters that actively pump the dopamine back into the presynaptic neuron for repackaging and reuse. Methamphetamine um, changes the properties of that dopamine transporter so it actually causes more dopamine to be released instead of being taken up. So it reverses the direction of the of dopamine transporter. Obviously that's going to increase the amount of dopamine in the synapse and, pull up and accentuate the effect. Uh, another stimulant that you certainly have heard about, cocaine, um, is either uh, typically either inhaled and sort of gives absorption to the uh, nasal mucosa or it is um, smoke, you know, converted to a smokable form, vaporized and inhaled through the lungs. Um, either way it enters the brain very quickly, uh, more, more quickly than methamphetamine in fact. It has also a direct effect on the dopamine transporter, but rather than um, reversing it, it, it blocks it, seals it up. Again, having the uh, resulting effect of increasing the amount of dopamine in the synaptic cleft for a longer amount of time. Now, um, part of what happens in situations of long-term drug abuse is that the brain actually changes in response to the repeated exposure to the substance. And this is certainly the case in cocaine use. So here's that uh, slide that I was talking about where we're looking at a slice through the brain at the level of the basal ganglia, including the nucleus accumbens, NA here. Um, and this is a, a positron emission tomography. Just to out some more terminology. Uh, this is a technique that, a brain scan technique that lets researchers observe where labeled molecules are actually bound within a living human brain. It's one of very few ways we have to actually study the effect of drugs on humans. Um, by far the majority of what we know that I've just been talking about is from either uh, just biochemical or animal studies. But in humans we can use PET, positron emission tomography, to look at actual binding. And so here's um, where they've mapped out the um, dopamine binding to a particular kind of receptor, the D3 receptor. Anyway, the bottom line is here, this is the uh, distribution of receptors in a normal individual and in a chronic cocaine user, uh, there are far more receptors present. So the, the brain adapts to this abnormal activation of its reward pathway by actually changing its structure and its biochemistry. So that's one reason why habits Drug abuse habits can be extremely difficult to break. Yeah. Sorry. Is there a question? Oh no, I'm sorry. Okay. No Is question. it reversible? Yeah. Um, I think so. I think uh, this would tend to decrease with abstinence, but I, I don't know that anybody has studied whether it's you know fully reversed over time. Um, another member of the stimulant class are amphetamines. Uh, you may have heard of uh, benzedrine and dexedrine. This illustration just shows that they are closely chemically related. They're uh, optical isomers, if you've ever heard that term, of each other. Um, or dexedrine is one of the two forms here. It's the form on the right. Um, amphetamine, benzedrine, when it first was um, produced about 100 years ago. It was um, thought of as sort of a panacea, a wonder drug that had many, many uses in everyday life. And it says there it was used um, in the military and was used by lots of people who wanted to have more fun and stay awake longer. 
Uh, it's currently still considered effective for uh, ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and um, it, one of its effects is to, besides activating the, the dopamine receptors, it feeds into the opioid pathway. So again, showing the, the tight linkage between these two um, neurotransmitter systems in the brain and affect wide areas of the different parts of the brain. Alcohol. So we're kind of working our way down the addictiveness scale. I didn't think I needed to put in a, 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 any sort of graphic uh, to go along with alcohol, because you can all just look at the table in front of you. Um, alcohol is a, a really interesting drug for a lot of reasons. The previous ones we were talking about are fairly specific in their binding characteristics, uh, what receptors and the um, different parts of the brain they bind to. But alcohol, it turns out, has, uh, has complex pharmacology, lots of different neurotransmitter systems are involved, and they're learning more about it all the time. Um, the dopamine pathway for sure, also glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, serotonin. Cannabinoids, I didn't mention um, earlier, our brain has cannabinoid receptors. Cannabinoid receptors were named uh, after cannabis, obviously, so they didn't know that our brain had cannabinoid receptors until after they started trying to figure out how cannabis affects our brain, and then they discovered these normally present receptors and the fact that there are um, neurotransmitters in our brain that, that normally activate them. Uh, alcohol, okay, addictive is fairly high. Um, again, as with everything else, the VTA, nucleus accumbens, and prefrontal cortex are involved. Um, one of the things that makes alcohol problematic is that it uh, is toxic in large doses, a single large dose can be fatal. Uh, it, causes, it clearly causes brain damage with long-term heavy use. And as I think we've all been reading about a lot lately, uh, increased awareness of fetal alcohol syndrome. In fact, um, they now have realized that the amount of alcohol that can um, be present in the mother's body even after maybe even a single drink can have detectable effects on embryonic development. Again, it just shows that it's a pretty non-specifically acting molecule and it can interfere with lots of biochemical processes throughout the body, not just the brain. But it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting um, drug. We have long-standing cultural relationship with alcohol, at least in this culture, and so I couldn't help um, putting in this um, bit about, this, this was just this past week in a prestigious journal, Proceedings from the National Academy of Sciences. This was uh, reported. Um, it's a picture of a couple of prairie voles there. As I said, uh, most of what we know about psychoactive drugs comes from studies of animals. And this is one interesting model because prairie voles in the wild, they say, are, are monogamous. They pair bond for life. So. It's an interesting model to study pair bonding as well as to study the effects of alcohol. So in this experiment, uh, as it says, female and male voles were, were partnered up and given access to, some of them were just given uh, water and some were given access to uh, ethanol, alcohol as well. And then after 24 hours drinking together, they were separated into <laughs> different cages. And then later they tested them for, um, would they prefer to mate with their prior uh, drinking partner or or, or cohabiting partner, or would they prefer a different uh, partner? So what do you think happened? Drinking buddy. <laughs> okay, well as it says, there was a sex dependent effect <laughs> that alcohol made the females more likely to pair bond with their drinking partner, <laughs> but alcohol made males less likely. <laughs> And the authors of this paper, you know, they, they noted that this may have a relevance to human behavior as well. So. Another round for the women. Very, very interesting drug. Very interesting drug. Um, what else we got? Um, another class of important psychoactive drugs, very important clinically, and um, also used recreationally, are the, the sedatives, which include Barbiturates, benzodiazepine, the most common name for benzodiazepine, the most common trade name is Valium, if you've heard of. Um, and 
uh, gamma hydroxybutyrate or GHB. So these affect the GABA receptors as a general rule. And GABA is an, considered an inhibitory neurotransmitter. When it binds, it suppresses the probability that the postsynaptic neuron will fire at action potential. So if it, uh, if it, if they potentiate those inhibitory effects. Um, they, people develop tolerance to um, sedatives, uh, depending on, to a great deal on, on what sedative it is. Um, and there can be risks of overdose as well as um, uh, tolerance. So the figure on the right just shows, again, this is our um, chloride channel with the normally uh, activating molecule GABA binding to a particular site and is showing that benzodiazepines or barbiturates bind to other sites in the protein structure and modify the activity of the, of the channel. Um, the world's most popular psychoactive substance, I think, is caffeine. It uh, activates yet another type of receptor we haven't talked about. Adenosine is another small molecule that acts as a neurotransmitter for some neurons. Um, in terms of addictiveness, um, it's generally not considered to be addictive, but I and many of you here, I'm sure, are chemically dependent on it, and if I don't get my caffeine in the morning, I will have a headache later in the day. It's effective in treating headaches uh, because of uh, its effect on uh, vasoconstriction and it's also a di diuretic. Um, okay, cannabis, also known as marijuana. Uh, cannabis is the, the old classic name before it was, before the Mexican slang word marijuana was attached to it. It activates, as I said, the cannabinoid receptors, which are, um, as far as we know, all located on the presynaptic uh, terminal of neurons that use something else for the actual neurotransmitter, so it modulates the effect of the, of the synapse. Um, not, again, not considered addictive, um, depending on how you define tolerance or dependence, um, somewhere between five and 10% of regular users develop some form of, of tolerance or dependence. Um, it certainly affects our capacity to learn new information, to recall information, as long as you're under the acute effects of it. But uh, studies, lots of studies, this has been studied pretty sensibly, um, have not found any long-term effect on cognition or brain structure, even in long-term high dose users, um, although it may be that adolescent, the adolescent brain is more sensitive to its effects, and that's currently under the um, basis of a lot of research. Um, I didn't really know where to put solvents or inhalants in this whole scheme. I sort of stuck them in the middle. I, I have trouble actually thinking of them as drugs, but if we're going to be broad here and include everything that has a psychoactive effect, regardless of its specificity for a particular receptor, we have to include it. Um, so the picture of somebody huffing paint there um, is an example of how it's uh, used. I mean, this is one, if, for a lot of drugs, we could talk about use or we can talk about abuse, and where do you draw the line between use and abuse, but I think we could all agree that for something like this, any use is abuse. It is, again, uh, it, it's essentially solvents that are just starting to dissolve your brain and other body structures, um, which is not the way I want to experience altered reality, and it can be um, toxic, cause <laughs> cardiac rhythm. Uh, okay, working our way down in the, the addictiveness scale, we come to uh, MDMA or ecstasy. It's a related to amphetamines in its structure. Uh, and like amphetamine, it affects dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, to a greater extent than the other stimulants, it also affects serotonin synapses, uh, which undoubtedly accounts for the fact that it's um, sort of a hybrid, as it says, a hybrid between a stimulant and a psychedelic. Um, 
So we, one would expect it to have addictive properties like the other stimulants, but it, it doesn't really seem to, for reasons that are not altogether clear. Um, it may, and again, it's um, been sometimes talked about as being toxic, and there are certainly situations where people have used MDMA and have later had uh, negative, even, even fatal, results, but uh, in every case that has been looked at, it seems likely that that's, that's either due to other effects like dehydration or to contaminants in this um, uh, street drug. What's the common name? Ecstasy. Ecstasy, sorry, yeah. No, we're, we're coming to, we're coming to acid. That's, we're working our way down the addictiveness uh, the scale. Uh, MDMA, though, is interesting. There's a, a, a recent paper um, that, where they were look, correlating the subjective effects of MDMA. So in this experiment, they had um, volunteers, healthy young people who had some but not uh, a lot of experience with ecstasy, and they gave them either a placebo or MDMA, and then asked them whether they agreed with these uh, statements. And so I don't know, can you read that? Some of you from back, so I says like I felt amazing, I felt an inner warmth, um, I felt loved up, I felt really sharp. Um, this one here, I felt entirely normal, uh, was the most likely answer for people who had the placebo. So that shows that the people can tell whether they're uh, under the effect or not. Um, and then the ones that have the asterisks by them are the ones that correlated most highly with the no, with the next part of the experiment which was that they looked at the effect on the brain um, by scanning, looking at changes in blood flow in different brain regions. So um, this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of the middle, two different, two different um, planes. This is right through the midline, mid-sagittal, and then this is a little bit lateral to that. So this just shows that in specific regions of the brain, they found that the uh, this medial temporal area was um, affected MDMA. So it's interesting, I mean, to think that something that specifically affects neurotransmission at particular synapses leads to these measurable changes um, on a larger scale within the brain. And this is something that, that I think we can use to give us some insight into how, how consciousness actually works as we're going, if we're building up from individual synapses to higher level structure in the brain. So it's an interesting uh, area of research. Another class of drugs, again, uh, psychedelics. So we were just saying that MDMA ecstasy has some psychedelic uh, properties, but we don't um, necessarily put it in the same category with these psychedelics. LSD or acid, lysergic acid, diethylamide, psilocybin, mescaline, those are naturally occurring uh, psychedelics. These all stimulate the serotonin receptors, specifically the serotonin 2 class of receptors. And it's complicated. Everything's more complicated than I've been saying here. LSD activates some serotonin receptors and blocks others. As far as anybody has been able to tell, and this has been studied a lot, um, physical dependence does not occur. It's not addictive. And also, it doesn't seem to be damaging to cells. You know, back in the 60s when this was first being studied or um, guessed about before it was being studied, people were uh, saying that it, it causes chromosome damage and birth defects, and, and those have been looked at carefully in there. Um, there's no evidence for it. Um, so, it's like, yeah, quick question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't think there's any basis for that, and you're probably not going into space. Uh, so, yeah. No, again, that's, you know, it's amazing what they'll tell kids. Um, so psychedelics, as, as Timothy Leary had uh, said back in the 60s, potentially offer us um, some insight into um, how our brains work and how we experience the reality around us. Um, this uh, recent work um, makes some headway into looking at why that might be. Yeah, so just like 
uh, MDMA, the specific synaptic effects of these, these drugs play out on a larger scale in the brain. So um, we've known for some time that when we're conscious, there is a, a certain amount of synchrony between the um, brainwave activity in different regions of the brain. So there's these what are called uh, resting state networks that are set up within the brain. And it turns out that uh, this experiment where they um, gave subjects psilocybin and then did uh, magnetoencephalography to detect their brain waves, they found that in these various regions, these seven different steady state networks were um, significantly, as it says, desynchronized by the drug. So again, we're just starting to learn anything at all about consciousness and any tool that we can use to help us get a handle on how it works, I think is worth, is worth more study. Okay, so that's our tour of some commonly um, used psychoactive drugs. And as I think I've, I've been able to make clear, they all affect brain in different ways, and they act on different neurotransmitter systems, and that's, that's why they all seem different. And that's, from a pharmacologist's point of view, why it is so useless to try to lump them all together and just talk about drugs when you really mean something. I mean, there's a time and place to say the word drugs, but if you really mean something more specific, say the more specific thing or you'll actually be wrong. So um, now I want to switch a little bit and, and um, talk about the legal system under which our drugs are regulated in this country. So it's under the, um, and, and we would hope to some extent that drugs that are classified more strictly, uh, as you see what are called the Schedule One drugs, that there's actually some scientific basis for it, that they actually are more addictive or more harmful or, or something. So the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 lays out five schedules or classifications of substances. And uh, quoting from um, the term controlled substance means a drug or other substance or a precursor. Um, and I think the first clue we have here that this is not going to be entirely scientific is where it says that Distilled spirits, wine, malt, beverage, or tobacco um, are not included. So obviously that's for, not for scientific reasons, that's for political and economic reasons. So what's in Schedule 1? The most restricted schedule, high potential for abuse. And um, according to the Controlled Substances Act, drugs that have no currently accepted medical use, not that they asked, clinicians about that um, and lack appropriate safety and may not be prescribed under any circumstances so what do these include um, GHB this um, sedative that I mentioned briefly gamma hydroxybutyrate um, it was initially not schedule one but in 2000 it was placed in schedule one um, as it says, after recreational use, it led to emergency room visits, hospitalizations, but they didn't really want to put it all the way into Schedule 1 because they thought it might still be some use, so they, for limited uses, it's in Schedule 3. Marijuana, cannabis, uh, as you may very well know, has long been in a Schedule 1 drug, even though, as we just talked about, the potential for tolerance uh, is very low, and Many people use it regularly without any obvious ill effects. Heroin is in Schedule 1. Again, it cannot be prescribed for any use, even though other countries don't feel that way about it. It's used in some European countries as a potent pain reliever. And in some other countries, they find that it is useful for helping um, addicts um, manage their addiction. MDMA ecstasy, also Schedule 1, even though uh, that was not the uh, medical community's consensus on it. And all the psychedelic drugs are Schedule 1, cannot be used, um, and it's even difficult to obtain them for research, many investigators find. Yeah. Uh, GH, um, I don't know that there's a common name for it, uh, GHB, I think it's just called GHB. It's, um, 
Georgia so, homeboy. What, sorry? Georgia homeboy. Georgia homeboy. Okay, that could be I mean, that one. Um, because because of its sedative properties, it sometimes administered surreptitiously and involved in sexual assault. Yes, date, the date rape drug. The date rape. Okay. Yeah, date rape drug. Yeah, I'm sure that contributed to its placement on the schedule, irrespective of its actual clinical properties. Um, and uh, uh, quaaludes, remember quaaludes, methicolone, previously uh, used as a sedative, but it was rescheduled again for reasons that were more political than, than medical. Schedule two then is the next uh, less restrictive, although they have a high potential for, for abuse, they do have accepted medical use with restrictions. Um, they are all supposed to be drugs that lead to physiological or psychological dependence. And uh, they can be prescribed, but they can't be refilled. These include things like, like cocaine. So we all think of cocaine as being more dangerous than marijuana, I think. But in fact, it's reversed in the, in the schedule. If that means opium, um, Oxycontin, another synthetic opiate, fentanyl. These are all Schedule Two. Um, codeine, uh, second, uh, secondol, secobarbital, another um, sedative. Other um, barbiturates are there. So just to give you an idea, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this. And then Schedule Three. So there's five schedules. When they get to Schedule Three. There are ones that have less potential for abuse, to have medical uh, uses. Um, to be refilled a little less restrictively. Okay, and then um, rather than go to schedule four and five, just to um, think about another way of deciding whether or not the way drugs are currently uh, scheduled and classified in the U.S. would be to compare our system to that of another country. And uh, this compares on the left the U.S. classifications versus those in the United Kingdom, Britain, and the lines show where things that are in um, one category in one country are in a different category in a different country. Now, there doesn't, it's hard to make a direct comparison between the two classification systems because we have five and they have three. But a couple things that stand out are that, um, well, one thing that stands out to me is that uh, cannabis, marijuana, is um, schedule one in our system, but in uh, Britain, it is a class B, and in fact, it had been for a while a class C uh, drug, less restricted, until it was, for strictly political reasons, um, moved back into, the, into class B. So again, this is another indication that it's not. if it were entirely scientific, it would be uniform across the world, because scientists work as an as a international community. Um, okay, so... Here's our current classification. It does not correlate very well with the objective assessment of the risks of the substances. And as we saw, it excludes alcohol and nicotine, which um, are certainly problematic substances. I want to introduce one of the, uh, the, the protagonists, one of the, the heroes in this story, as I see it, Professor David Nutt is an eminent researcher in London, at Imperial College in London. Um, he has uh, published widely with uh, scientists both in the UK and the rest of the world, which is a clear indication of his, his stature in the field. Uh, he also has the distinction of having been fired um, as the uh, chair of the British um, Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs over his protest when marijuana was reclassified from a Class C to a Class B drug in 2009. He said, no, there's no basis for this, this should not be happening, and that got him in trouble with certain members of the government, and um, he was forced to step down from that position. After that, he uh, started uh, an independent group, the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs, um, which you can find more easily online by the name Drug, Se Drug Science, um, in order to carry on the work of the advisory committee as he thought it should be carried on. 
He's, his approach is primarily one of what's a uh, term you may have heard, what's called harm reduction. Let's just accept the fact that humans like to experience altered states of consciousness, and they always will, and let's just find ways to allow that to happen with the least harm to the user and the least harm to society. So to that end, for instance, he's currently involved in efforts to come up with new pharmaceuticals that would allow people to experience the desirable or the preferred effects of alcohol without the negative effects. And as we we're saying, um, alcohol has such a, a broad and non-specific activity on different neurotransmitter systems, it makes sense that if we can find out exactly which neurotransmitter system is uh, primarily responsible for those desirable anti-anxiety effects that I think most of us appreciate when we have that first drink. If we come up with a drug that just did that and didn't lead to, say, motor, the loss of motor control and the other negative effects of alcohol, that would be a good thing. So this is one of the areas where uh, Dave and I is currently working. Um, but what I want to talk about primarily uh, with regard to this eminent researcher is um, some work that he and the rest of the independent committee published in uh, the Medical Journal Lancet in 2010. They wanted to uh, step back and reassess all of these drugs that are commonly used from a objective scientific viewpoint. So they had a, a panel that involved um, both pharmacologists and people with more of a social science perspective and legal perspective, and they assessed uh, all of these substances individually um, from a couple of different ways. So they wanted to, so they, to come up with a measure of overall harm, they broke it down into harm to the user or harm to others. And then in terms of harm to the user, physical or social use, so the specific things here are like mortality, drug-related damage, dependence, um, loss of relationships, and in terms of harms to others, they looked at injury, crime, economic cost, family adversities, and they uh, all came to a consensus about the, how each of the, every substance was weighted with regard to each of these um, negative characteristics. And so here is what their results look like. Kind of a busy slide, but there's a lot of information back in it. So at the bottom we see all of these substances, many of which we just talked about. I hope you can read them from the back. Alcohol, heroin, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, cocaine, tobacco, amphetamine, cannabis is there, GHB is there, um, benzodiazepines, um, ketamine, methadone, and then some others going down down to ecstasy, LSD, and mushrooms at this end. So as you can see, these are ranked in the order of the overall harm that these um, scientists in an objective analysis assigned to them. And again, so it's broken down into all of these different categories of harm. And uh, just to simplify things, let's look at the, another figure from that paper where just simply harm, in blue is the harm to the user and in red is the harm to others. And so they're in the same order here. And so what stands out? Well, the one that is ranked as the most harmful, primarily because of the harm to others, is alcohol. Um, heroin is next, although that one has a, a greater spectrum of harm to the user, as, as especially does cocaine. So harm to others is relatively uh, less with, uh, with crack cocaine. And we can see these all, most of them then are more harmful to the user than to others. Really, alcohol is one that stands out for the greatest amount of socially directed harm. And down at the very end here, uh, mushrooms, they couldn't see any evidence of harm to others and relatively little harm to the user, also with LSD. So it's pretty clear, and they also looked at, was there any statistical correlation between this uh, ranking and the uh, current legal classification of drugs, and they found that there was absolutely no statistically significant correlation. 
These, uh, I can give you the references later on. I'll pick up my email address then. But yeah, this is from an article that was published in the uh, prominent medical journal Lancet in 2010. And again, it's by uh, Nutt and colleagues. Okay, so um, I guess it's two. The, the, so al those alcohol, heroin, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, cocaine, tobacco, amphetamine, cannabis, GHB, Valium, and then there's some others that we're not so familiar with. Butane here is an inhalant, uh, and then LSD and mushrooms. Yeah. Well, okay, so we've got, got a lot to do to get our uh, drug policy in the U.S. more in line with, with scientific thinking. Um, Okay. Well, that's a good point, and for, for a lot of these, the harm to, oh, I'm sorry, the question was um, the, uh, the high amount of harm to others, or harm overall, I mean, did, did they account for the fact that it's so widely used? So let me just say that I don't think that this is the, the end of the story. I think this is an excellent first step in a more rational uh, classification system. But I think, for instance, with regard to alcohol, um, it would be important to take into account that even though there's a, you know, a lot of harm caused both to users and to others, that has to be balanced against the fact that, that I guess I would I'll go ahead and say all of us here are able to use alcohol without any apparent ill effects. So we have to weigh that positive aspect of it against the harms. And, and I don't know whether that was taken into account here. So no, th there's room for lots more analysis and discussion about this. But but you know clearly this is a, a better step in the right direction. Is, is, was there any factoring in? I know a lot of you know. If you buy LSD or, or ecstasy on the street, I mean, half the time it's cut with as much amphetamines and other stuff. I, I mean, I, is, is yeah, I, I think that they um, classify the harms from the point of view of what's currently available. So, for instance, in terms of environmental harms, that was one of their categories. Like, um, you know, a, a methamphetamine a clandestine lab will potentially cause environmental contamination. But on the other hand, if it were not prohibited, there wouldn't be any need for clandestine labs, and people could buy, you know, properly synthesized and and tested chemicals. So Hard yeah. To find a good chemist, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I need to uh, try to make my last points here. So I think you know we're all um, we've all heard of situations where U.S. government policies are called unscientific or even anti-science. Um, examples might have to do with wildlife management policies, fisheries policies, or our, our government's uh, current inability to accept global warming as a reality. We're all used to thinking of certain government policies as being unscientific, but I would um, posit that our drugs policy is the most long-standing, one of the most obviously unscientific things that our government does. How do you be unscientific? Um, and act, obviously, enact laws and policies based on politics and prejudice, frank prejudice, rather than science. Anybody here who is familiar with the history of cannabis prohibition knows how much racial prejudice was involved in that era of our history. Prevent collection of new evidence. Um, many researchers who would like to study, for instance, the medical, potential medical uses of cannabis uh, or to use um, psychedelics to understand consciousness better, find it difficult to do that research because of the restrictions placed on the use of these, uh, on legitimate use of these drugs. Appoint panels of researchers and policy experts and then ignore their recommendations. I mean, our drugs policy has a history of this going back to the 19th century. The, the, the British Indian Hemp Commission looked at the use of, of cannabis in the British colonies. And, and then probably the most well-known of the US is the Schaefer Commission that was put together under Richard Nixon. And just like every other example of a, a 
a blue ribbon panel that's been appointed to look at cannabis come back and said, you know, objectively this is really not harmful stuff, and specifically the Schaefer Commission said that the harms caused by prohibition are far greater than the harms caused by use of the substance itself. Has that changed, you know, has that changed our policy? So, in conclusion, I would say, I would charge you that you simply cannot support current U.S. drug policy and call yourself a, well, scientist, obviously. Um, you cannot, I think, call yourself a compassionate, ethical person. Um, if uh, certainly um, incarcerating people for using substances that are not harming other people cannot be considered compassionate. And in terms of uh, the ethical question, this was something that was just brought to my attention recently. Um, a student at UAA uh, was um, presenting a paper in the recent uh, student showcase, and um, she had written something I thought quite succinct about, oh, not even class, about an ethical, looking at the ethics of these. Um, Laura Vaught is her name. She's actually here with us today. Thanks for coming, Laura. Um, Laura wrote in the um, abstract to her paper on uh, drug offenders in the U.S. prison, prison system that in the United States, a high incarceration rate for nonviolent drug offenders is unethical from a utilitarian perspective. Under utilitarianism, the total amount of utility created by an action determines whether that action is right or wrong. The harsh drug laws in this country hurt more people than they help and therefore do not maximize utility, deeming them unethical. The United States incarcerates people at the highest rate in the world, but we do not have a uh, correspondingly decreasing rate in drug use or trafficking to show for it. The punishments for these crimes do not match the harm they, that they cause, but rather haunt the offender for life and severely limit chances for success in the future. I couldn't have said it more succinctly myself. So, from an ethical, I was unaware of the utilitarian perspective on ethics, and I found that very interesting. But maybe you don't care about whether it's scientific or not. Maybe you don't care about being a compassionate, ethical person. Maybe all you care about is law and order. But I would say that you cannot even logically call yourself a supporter of law and order and support our current drugs policy. Um, you know, I'm all for order. I'm a scientist. I love order. I like things to be orderly. But to my mind, there can be, that does not mean that we need more laws. Um, there are such a thing as bad laws. And if you have a, in a free society, in a free democratic society, if you have a law which a majority of the people disagree with, and in recent polls, 70 to 80 percent of respondents say that um, people should not be jailed for using marijuana. If you have laws like that in the books, those are bad laws. And having bad laws, I believe, undermines the effectiveness of good laws. So anybody who really believes in law and order should make sure that we are really careful about the kind of laws that we have and the kind of laws that we ask our police officers to enforce. I would not want to be in the business of enforcing unpopular laws. So, that's the end of our presentation. Um, what can you do? Well, obviously you can, as Linda said earlier, you can go vote in August. And in before that and after that, if somebody in conversation says to you, Drugs. He's on drugs. He must be on drugs. Oh, they're doing drugs. Oh, we got in trouble for drugs. Ask them, what drug or drugs are you talking about? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I've been reminded to repeat questions if anybody wants to ask a question. Right, I think so. Uh, the question was, do um, did the 
just say no to drugs message have the effect of, of backfiring and maybe encouraging, I mean, uh, encouraging kids to try it. I, I think there's evidence for that. People have looked at this um, DARE program, that I think we all know what DARE is, is in schools. Um, there are surveys that show that students who went through the DARE program were actually more likely to try uh, drugs than students who weren't. And I mean, honestly, I, I think we're all worried. Uh, kids have pretty sensitive antennae for hypocrisy. And um, they know when, you know, people tell them that all drugs are bad, and yet they know that their, their friends and classmates who are smoking marijuana, and some of them are actually on the honor roll, they know that uh, they're not getting the whole story. So right, I think that the, the oversimplification, the, the frank inaccuracy of the calling everything drugs, yeah, has not, has not helped anybody. I, I don't know whether it was an intentional policy or one that was just not well thought out, but yeah, I would agree. It doesn't help. Yeah, question, yeah, okay. Just kind of touching off on the question that she asked, um, I, I went through the DARE program. Mm -hmm. I, most of the people that I went to school with did. There's kind of an inherent distrust along uh, with a lot of the people that I've spoken to um, in regard to trusting information that comes from authority figures in regard to drugs because of the lumping together, the misinformation exactly, that people yeah. fail. And so I was wondering, do you want to expand on that at all as far as potential damage caused by uh, abusing that trust? Does anybody want me to repeat that long question? I'm sorry. <laughs> the question is basically, um, do, do I feel that the tr trust is eroded by this uh, the war on drugs propaganda? And yeah, clearly, I, I think it does. And um, pretty much like I was saying to the, the previous questioner, it is, is something that, you know, we all talk about sending the wrong message, legalizing marijuana, or that'll send the wrong message. Well, honestly, I think we've been sending the wrong message for years by trying to convince kids that all drugs are the same. They know better, and since they know better, they're not going to believe anybody who says that they're all the same. Yeah. About well, what? Ayahuasca. Um, off the top of my head, nothing. I would have to look it up. That's what Wikipedia is for. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned clinical and recreational use. In clinical use, we always think about potency and dosage. Do you have anything to say about the potency of marijuana, or um, it currently as it as compared to what it was a generation or two ago? Okay. Yeah. Ron's question is about uh, the, in terms of accurate statements of, of potency about marijuana, and is it? So I mean, I, everybody who's looked at it, the THC content in um, cannabis, that's marijuana that's available now, is on average much higher than it was 40 years ago. Although there have always been a range of potencies of THC content available, when you get into it um, in detail, you got to look at the, not just THC, but the other cannabinoids, cannabidiol, those have somewhat different properties on the user. But I think the most important thing to think about it is right now, it would be great if when anybody buys marijuana, they knew what the THC count, what the cannabinoid profile was. And after legalization in a regu regulatory regime, you'll be able to go into your local store and look at the label and say, oh, this is 14% oh, uh, THC. OK, I think I'll try that. And you'll have, you know, it'll have been tested. It'll be like any other regulated drug, which has got to be a step in the right direction. Yeah. The question is, uh, is there, do I know of any evidence uh, for cannabis having effects on long-term memory and on motivation? Yeah, again, that's something that has been looked at a lot, as you can imagine. And all of the studies that I'm aware of that have looked at adult users, and they, you know, they recruit people who are long-term users and or report being long-term users, report using it at a uh, fairly high levels. Um, if you get these people away from cannabis for a while and do tests of their cognitive memory abilities, they're within the normal range. You know, there, it, there's no evidence that even heavy use of cannabis over the long term permanently affects cognition and memory. 
I mean, it's surprising because you know because of the the acute effects can be so pronounced. You would think that the long term effects might be similar, um, but they they really have not been able to show that. Yeah. Question. Yeah, peyote was under the, uh, so peyote is uh, mescaline, mescaline, and yeah, that was under the psychedelics. Yeah? Um, with the information that we have, so readily available now, how long do you think it'll take before we actually reform U.S. drug policy to make it where it makes sense? Yeah, the question was how, how, there we go, how long will it take to reform U.S. drug policy? Or, I mean, do you, think you know, we, a lot of us, a lot of us thought, that 40 years ago, we were making progress, um, but then, and with you know, with the Reagan administration of the 1980s, that is it's got completely reversed. It's, and and now things are seem to be changing rapidly. We have a couple states have legalized marijuana. We have uh, the Department of Justice talking about changing the mandatory minimum approach to sentencing. It seems like all of a sudden, like people are waking up to the fact that we've been doing things wrong for so long. So. I, I hate to speculate, but I'm, 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 yeah, I'm as amazed as anybody else by the way things seem to change for no, no apparent reason. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, okay. I have no idea, but nothing surprising. Yeah. Um, do you think that a president who is more pro-drug reform could really do a lot more than, like, I guess, the opposite effect of such as I know Obama. Right, yeah, this question is commenting on uh, recent uh, statements by uh, President Obama that acknowledging that marijuana is probably less harmful, or I don't know exactly what he said, less harmful or no more harmful than alcohol. And do I think that the uh, executive branch led by the president could do more? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the president could say that we're no longer enfor enforcing marijuana laws at the federal level. Having a lot of trouble convincing people in the DEA that that's the way to go, uh, but that would that would be a great lasting legacy, I think, for his last days in office. <laughs> One more question. Uh, do you have any evidence of uh, necessarily the effects of marijuana use on the mental health? Okay, so the question was about effect of uh, marijuana use on the lungs, um, and that's something that's you know an obvious question. Uh, it's smoke, and we're all. Uh, Accustomed to knowing that tobacco smoke is a uh, carcinogen, and so this has been looked at very carefully. And there was uh, one researcher named uh, was first name Tashkin, um, was his last name, who uh, had a lot of government funding for many years and was trying to convince himself that marijuana caused lung cancer. But he was a good scientist and looked at it objectively and finally came out and said, you know what? There is no evidence that marijuana smoking causes lung cancer. It, it, uh, you can get bronchitis, um, but um, uh, the congestive pulmonary disease also does not seem to be a major outcome of, of long-term extensive marijuana use. So no, it, it's a different kind of smoke, and you know, it make a cough, but it doesn't seem to lead to lung cancer. Okay, one more question. Uh, okay, all right. Oh, okay, I'm sorry if I didn't call. Who's that? Oh, Linda. Okay. Without talking about bad laws, one of the things like the marijuana law, what they don't, you don't hear a lot about is how much it breaks up families, the social part of it. The families right. Are yeah. Really yeah. Linda was going to um, bring up the, the social cost of our policy of prohibition, incarcerating otherwise law abiding, good family people. Um, and again, that's, yeah, that's. Part of what I said, that the harms caused by prohibition far outweigh any harm caused by the drug itself. And certainly that's true with our, our cannabis policy. Can I bring you a California perspective? A California perspective. It's regulated, you know, for medical purposes. They're not just what we're talking And all of your, uh, if we're talking about, you know, THC levels, high CBD levels, so people can educate, yes, or an educated decision what they're trying to do or whatever treatment purposes they need. Um, it is working. working. Yeah, so a regulatory regime for cannabis where customers can, can know the cannabinoid profile and the potency of what they want to buy, it's got to be a good thing. <laughs>
There's also it's working you know, California. just smoking, there's wax, right. yeah. oils, yeah. you know, so. they're using different ways to ingest it. You know, so if you don't want to do smoke, so you think you might cause another damage, you've got that. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's probably not a perfect system, but it's right. definitely better than, than we're right now. Anyway, thanks again. Thanks for listening.